All right, Matt Davio back again today with Erica Olson. Erica is the author of, I'm going to put this up here, <laughs> Zero Sum Game, which is the story of the rise of the world's largest derivatives exchange, which we now know today as the CME, but it, uh, Erica had the, the pleasure, I guess, of uh, starting working at the CBOT, who then got acquired by the CME back in uh, the 06, 07, 08 time frame, and uh, that's what the book's about. Thanks for coming on today, Erica. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So, uh, again, we're going to get into the book a little bit, and I, I did fin- finish it, as I told you last night, and it's a, it's a very, very descriptive book, and, and why wouldn't it be? You, were, uh, you, you, you started in a position interviewing for the managing director of marketing at the CBOT in the summer of 06. Yes. And you started work basically right after the Labor Day, after you had a nice vacation, as you stayed in the <laughs> And then pretty much the, the day you started, there was a, there was a bid uh, across town by the CME for the CBOT. Yes, and the funny thing was I had actually been, the prior three years I had been working um, on the Bank One J.P. Morgan merger. Okay. I, had joined Bank, I had joined Bank One in August of 2003, and then in December was when J.P. Morgan you know, announced that it was buying Bank One. Right. So I spent three years working on that merger. I moved over to the Board of Trade. I was so excited. Absolutely loved everybody. I was I was excited to work in a much smaller company than, you know, the huge J.P. Morgan right. Chase. And it was my fifth week. My fifth week at the Board of Trade uh, was when Bernie Dan called a small group of us in and, you know, told all of us that in the middle of September, um, you know, he, Charlie, and a, and a very, very tight group of executives had been approached by the Merck, uh, you know, with a bid to buy the Board of Trade for $8 billion. And at that point in time, in early October 2006, was when he was bringing in, you know, a wider group of us to help with everything that had to be done before the public announcement, right. uh, which was in mid-October. So and with, I was and like, are you kidding me? Here we go again. <laughs> you, you know, so I, I want to ask you this because you don't really talk about it in the book explicitly. At any point after uh, this happened, do you think you got the job at the CBOT because of your experience at uh, JP and Bank One and going through that whole process? I mean, did you ever ask anybody? that question? Um, it, both uh, Bernie and Chris Malo, who was my uh, direct manager, you know, after uh, it was became public that the Merck had made a uh, an offer, they made it very clear to me that they did not know that the Merck, you know, was going to approach the Board of Trade at the time that I could, because I was going through my interviews in July of 2006, sure. and the Merck didn't, the Merck did not make this offer until uh, September, so, but Bernie had mentioned that um, because I had only been at the Board of Trade for five weeks, right. If because he knew that I had gone through the Bank One J.P. Morgan Chase merger and actually three other mergers before that, um, that is why he had he asked such a new employee such as myself to be on the merger team in the first place because I was actually the only one besides one other uh, woman in HR that had ever been through a merger. Yeah. Most of the people had worked for the Board of Trade there, you know, for decades. So right, because it was a standalone really for 150 some years. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yes. So let's go back. A a little bit. And you and I have, uh, again, some similar roots. We both attended the University of Michigan. You were in the BBA program, which is a very yes. elite uh, business school for undergrads. Not, you know, uh, not many people uh, get into that as an undergrad. Most people don't recognize that at Michigan, unless you're admitted into the BBA, you really don't, there's really not business degree. So I went the other way. I went econ, right. his, econ history. Okay. So why did you go that way? I always ask people, why, if, you know, if, why did you get the BBA at Michigan, especially, and you got a Harvard MBA afterwards, you know, why did you choose to do that kind of that double dip there? It's funny, my, I'm, I'm from Michigan, and my entire family uh, works for General Motors. Um, so, you know, both on the assembly line, and my father was an engineer, and so when I was in college, actually my first few years at Michigan, I was also doing internships at uh, GMC Truck, and kind of seeing the business side of things, I had also had two um, of my friend's sisters that I kind of looked up to as role models. They had gone to Michigan Business School. Okay. So between that internship and kind of seeing, you know, what some other people had chosen as career paths, I, I thought, hey, you know, if I can get in here, this is it. So. 
Yeah. That's and again, I, uh, I think there's some somewhere around 300, 350 that are admitted into it every year. So it's a very, very small program. And most of the most of the students obviously apply from, you know, uh, Michigan. They're already there. So you know, it, but it, it is another application process that you have to go through, and it's very, uh, very competitive. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Um, yeah, and, and I, I was surprised there were, you know, a. a to your point, you know, there were also a small number of people that actually transferred from East Coast schools, and I had no idea. I didn't realize how lucky I was to actually, you know, be grow up in Michigan. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, after you graduated, you know, give, give me a little flavor on your interview process because, again, the BBA students definitely. Uh, I did a lot of interviewing, say, with the Harvard Endowment Fund, and when I interviewed with them in '88, they were. A mere four billion dollar entity, and I think they're about a thirty eight billion dollar entity today. So to mm-hmm. give people some scale in the short twenty two years, what's happened there? You know, what kind of what kind of interviews were you going through? And you definitely had better access as a BBA student than us over in the LSMA with the the, the business jobs. Well, it's it's kind of funny now that I think back because I had in my head as so many. Young people do, I think, still even today, that consulting was going to be this glamorous career of, you know, jetting around the country and expense, you know, expense accounts and fancy hotels. And so I interviewed for um, some technology consulting jobs and I um, ended up uh, getting a job with a consulting company called Systems Consulting Group. Okay. And bef- before I even, and they were doing, you know, case interviews, kind of giving you, you know, certain situ- business situations and see how uh, see how you would handle them. And the funny thing was, this is what started my five merger run before <laughs> I even graduated from Michigan. That company was bought out. Really? And it became a company called Cambridge Technology Partners, which yeah. still exists today. I'm familiar with um, And, yeah, and so, you know, when I had actually graduated, that that's, was my first job. And um, I realized very early that, that that kind of lifestyle was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And I didn't last too long. I, I had a client that was out in Minneapolis, and I was flying there, you know, every week during the winter. It was awful. Yeah. Um, so from that point... For the next for the next four years until I went back to grad school, I was um, part of the whole dot com thing and and worked for two other you know web development companies and and had a great time. You know I learned a lot. If I write another book, it'll be about that <laughs> those days. So uh, so you you left Cambridge and kind of were hopping around uh, in, in a couple different you know web type companies then. And, and was, yes, that, the, was that was that the late nineties early two thousands when you were doing that? It was uh, mid '90s, so um, I had uh, been at Cambridge in '96. The next web company I was at was in uh, 1997, and that became um, the company that was called US Web, which then merged into a bigger company called March First, okay. um, and that was one of the big kind of web, you know, companies back in the day. I stayed there a year, and then um, in 1998, I opened the Chicago office for a Seattle-based web development company called Free Range Media, which eventually got rolled up into, like, nine other companies uh, to a company called Luminant Worldwide, which was another big one. But I stayed there three and a half years, so that was, like, a record for the web day. <laughs> I'm, so I'm going to ask you, you know, since, since you wrote a book about trading, were you were – you, uh, the benefactor of any, t- you know, during all these, you know, the the the, the days of the, the you know web 1.0, did you did you get any options? Did you cash in on any of these things during some of these smaller companies? I I consider myself a person who has very few regrets in life, but if I have only one regret, it is that I was so stupid to have never cashed in anything. Like, I would not have student loan debt right now if I had not had the faith that these companies would survive. I mean, everywhere I worked went ban- ended up going bankrupt, and okay. I had... I was not one of the rich people. Yeah. I, I didn't make zero money. Was there? Ever, I've got to ask you, Erica. Was there ever a time where you could have been liquid? You know, were you liquid? You know, sometimes you can't even sell your stock if you're not there long enough. But could you have sold stock and, and, and cashed in some money at times? 
Yeah, that's that's the kicker is that in the last company, um, the one that became Luminant, because I was there for so long, you know, three and a half years, um, I certainly could have cashed things. I mean, this is why I'm not a trader, right? It's, I'm, I'm just so stu- I'm so stupid, and it was never. I mean, I was always, you know, I was always very junior. It's not like I could have ever. You know, been a millionaire, but could I have, you know, maybe bought a car, maybe not had student loans from right. Michigan still? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> well, you know, that's, uh, there, you know, there's a lesson from that. And I, and I think the lesson is, especially when, uh, you know, you, you were basically given, I'm sure, sweat equity on top of your, your salary and bennies. But it's one of those things where if you, if you, I always say, you know, found money, take 80% off. It's the same yeah. thing if you're, if you're, it's the same thing if you're lucky enough to buy a stock, really don't know what they do, and then tomorrow they're, you know, the, 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 they go up 20, 30 percent. Don't be greedy. You know, it's always, uh, you know, take a piece off because uh, never, yeah. look, you know, never look a gift horse in the mouth. But so so then you went you went and got your MBA at Harvard and, and, and you did that again, probably as the bubble was bursting, 2002, three, somewhere in there. Um, yes, it was. I mean, one, the, the, for for all my mistakes during the web the web years of not realizing that it was you know all about to go bust and selling my shares. The one thing I did time well was when I applied and when I actually went to school because um, I I applied in 2000 and, and entered in 2001. Um, right. So I was there from 2001 to 2003. Perfect. And sure enough, um, that's near the end of 2001 was kind of when everything was going bankrupt and, and blowing up. So Yeah, but, so you're lucky um, on that end. You came out with a Harvard MBA and people were hiring again. So perfect timing. So see, so you're, you're not that bad of a trader. You, you, you you nailed that side of it. <laughs> I guess. You bought low and got your education. And, and then, so yeah, at that, yeah. after your MBA, did you start working for JP right away in, back in Chicago? Yes. I mean, that was the only thing that kind of my, my at that point, fiance, future husband and I agreed on is that, you know, we wanted to stay in Chicago. Okay. Um, so he was already back in Chicago. I only did my job search in Chicago and it was bank one that I ended yep. up joining um, at that point in time. Uh, and then, you know, a few months later. Here comes any, JP Morgan. So. Do you have any good do you have any good Jamie Diamond stories for us as a, as a bank one employee? Because that's where he was at that time. Right, and there is one at the very, it's in, I think, chapter two of my book where I do meet with him. Um, I did meet with him right when I joined Bank One, and it was because he had also gone um, to Harvard Business School, and I was, I guess, naive or, or, or just brave enough at that point in time to send him an email and say, hey, you know, you came, um, you'd spoken to our, my class, I'm here now, you know, just thought I'd say hi, and it was... Um, Labor Day 2003 that I, I looked like crap. I didn't even take a shower that day. Like, and I get a call and it's from his, um, administrative assistant saying, Hey, you know, Jamie can see you. And I was like, right now. <laughs> She's like, yeah. And so, you know, that's one of those calls where, you know, you jump and it doesn't matter if you look like hell. So, you know, I went over and went up to the executive floor and he was very laid back because it was the Friday before Labor, the Labor Day weekend. And, um, you know, just to just had a had a quick chat about kind of competitors. But when I look back now, I know that at that time he must have known about yeah. J.P. Morgan. You know, by that it was it was only like about a month and a half before um, J.P. Morgan's deal was public. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure he probably knew at that time. And I'm trying to think. This was obviously after he was shunned at uh, Citigroup, so he was moving on to the next thing. And, and you know, as as, oh, yes. a, as a master of the universe a type will do, there you know he's he's on to the next move. So. Yes. And, and so were you part of that, that whole, uh, you know, acquisition of uh, Bank One and JP? No, um, that that was the big difference, you know, for me is these other four mergers that I've been through before going to, to the Board of Trade. I always worked on kind of merger-related projects, meaning that um, I was always involved in the integration of the two companies and trying to, you know, kind of get everything working seamlessly. Yeah. But it wasn't until I was at Bank One where I actually was kind of involved before it was public. Okay. Um, so, you know, with Bank One, I, I found out at the same time everybody else did. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let, let, let's talk about this a little bit. Now, the book is, again, about the merger of the, of the big Chicago, uh, you know, Trading uh, 
engines, if you will, the C bot or the C bot where you were working, and yeah. the CME, which obviously became the suitor, the aggressor in the in the, in the merger process. But it wasn't that easy. This a lot of a lot of people may may not remember the story. So let's get into it a little bit. This was a yeah. You know, this took a long time for this transaction to happen from the day it was announced. And you had the pleasure of starting your job as uh, the managing director of marketing, really five weeks before this was announced. So right. walk us through uh, you know kind of the firestorm that that you know that the merger was. Well, it was really interesting because in my first five weeks before, um, you know, before we knew that the Merck was going to make an offer, I had been going around um, interviewing almost everybody and every major manager um, in the exchange just because I was new to the industry and trying to figure out how everything worked. Right. And um, it was really interesting to me just the sense I got of competitiveness with the Merck. And uh, I, I just never experienced anything like it. Um, yeah. Even at even at J.P. Morgan, I mean, we, you know, we had competitors, but it wasn't like this day-to-day kind of, um, you know, tension. And, and I would call it, you know, at, at that point in time, still a friendly tension, but still it was it was something that I was very, very aware of. And so, of course, when... You know, I found out that the Merck had made an offer for the Board of Trade. The first thing that went through my mind was, um, oh, oh, you still see me? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my my computer went into sleep. Uh, the first thing I thought was, wow. You know, I've yeah. just spent five weeks talking to everybody about this intense rivalry, and now this very same company is purchasing us. And um, if there's anything I learned, you know, going through four other mergers, it's that um, there is almost never a true merger. It is an acquisition. And usually the company that is doing the buying is the one whose culture and, you know, employees and, you know, if there's going to be um, some sort of give and take, you know, they're the ones that usually went out. Um, And so, you know. Yeah, whoever comes with the money usually ends up with a little bit of power, and I think that's true. Right, right. And, true life. And, and that's fair. And that's fair. But what? But you know, what I was thinking was that there were several people who had worked only at the Chicago Board of Trade for decades, whose you know families um, and you know generations had been involved with the company. So I thought, uh oh, you know, this is gonna <laughs> this is gonna make for some drama. And I started yeah. taking notes that day. So yeah, so we talked about this before we came on air, but you, you, you really saw this as an opportunity, and, 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 and I call it a trade-off. You knew, you knew that your job, obviously, wouldn't be here because you were cognizant right. been through uh, mergers, and as you said, the reason why you merge is there's, uh, you know, there's leverage that can be taken out of the system. People are, are, are erased, and there's efficiencies that are brought, especially in a situation like this. Not only were you merging two similar like companies, but they were based in the same town and had, you know, split the city, as you said, and families, one family worked for the CBOT, one family worked for the CME. So very, right. very interesting and not probably something that most people ever go through. I mean, you had basically two, you know, Chicago-centered businesses that, you know, these are the reasons why Chicago is as big as it is because of these two exchanges, yes. no doubt about it. Absolutely, and and it's funny because when I first had the idea, literally sitting there in the boardroom when you know Bernie was telling all of us about this deal, um, the first thing I thought was, okay, not only am I going to start taking notes, but that I would write a book about going through mergers as an acquiree. That was my initial idea for the book, and zero sum game um, on top of its relevance to actually futures trading, also in my mind applied to mergers for exactly what you said. Usually if there's a redundancy, you know, one person kind of keeps their job and one person doesn't. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what I was thinking at the beginning. But then as the as more and more twists and turns started and, and when ICE came into the picture with and started a bidding war, right. um, that's that's when I realized, wait a second, you know, this is this is not just a merger story. This is right. a this is a crazy historic um, stranger than fiction type of scenario that, you know, somebody such as myself who's always wanted to start a writing career, I thought, okay, you know, the corporate gods are trying to tell me something here, you know, take advantage of this. Well, you, you know, you talk about, it's interesting, you, you, you mentioned, I think, in your epilogue that, you know, one of your heroes, as far as a writer, is Michael Lewis. So, yes. all, you know, I'm not a writer, and I don't pretend to be one. Uh, I'm actually working on a book, but 
I can't write it. I've got to have a ghostwriter who can write like you can. <laughs> so my question to you, you obviously had read, you know, Liar's Poker and some of the yes. business books when you were going through school. Um, you know, and, and you did a great job. And, and, and that's something that's funny because after I read it, I'm like, wow, you know, she really did a, a great job modeling her storytelling kind of the way Michael Lewis does. I mean, he always tells a story with, you know, it's very much a, you know, it's a docudrama, if you will. It's real. There's factual yeah. information, but you're, you got those whole, uh, integrated, uh, relationships, uh, that, right. that are weaved throughout the book that make it compelling. Otherwise, you know, most people are going to go, oh, I'm not interested, you know, I, I don't, I don't know anything about trading. Why do I want to read about right. the CFP? But you did a fantastic job in doing that. So, uh, did you learn some of that from reading some of those books? I mean, was that something that you try to model, uh, you know, intuitively that way? You no, know, it was very, very conscious that I, um, I was, when I had read Liar's Poker, I, I'd read it a long time before I was at the Board of Trade, but then I revisited it when I, you know, realized that I wanted to try and write about the merger because, um, Liar's Poker is the only book Michael Lewis has written from his own point of view because he was there, he was an employee there. So I thought, okay, at that point, you know, he actually had been writing for um, Vanity Fair and a few other publications, but I took Liar's Poker as really the epitome of, you know, what somebody who isn't a financial journalist could write. Um, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not connected to any sort of publication. I was just an employee there and what I saw him do in that book was be able to weave what what in the um, publishing industry they like to call two narratives. So there's the story, which was the story of the people I worked with and the right. bidding war. But then there's also just very, very high level, uh, for lack of a better word, education about yeah. what exchanges do, you know, what futures trading is. Yeah. Um, and that part is clearly meant for people outside of the industry. Um, but, you know, what the feedback I've gotten the most is that I really nailed the characters, meaning yeah. the real people that I worked with. I mean, those who know these executives and the people at the Board of Trade and the Merck, yeah. um, I've heard from their wives, their kids, their, you know, you, they're like, you, you nailed them. This is exactly yeah. how they are. So to me, that's, that is the best thing to hear because that's really, you know, it's really always a story about people. Every business Absolutely. story still is a story about people, right? Yeah. And, I, and, I, and again, I have to you know, tip my hat because I thought the same thing, and I don't know most of the, the characters. I know a handful of them in the book, but just a great job of, of really getting me excited and wanting to know more about them and, and really uh, you know, detailing that drama that went on. Like you said, you knew you were writing a book, so... Right. You know, that, that's a little easier. A lot of people, they were just, they were, they, they were grasping for their jobs, right? They wanted to continue working, yeah. you know, they just figured, hey, I've, I've worked here 20 years, I'm not going to leave. So it was a stressful yeah. time for many people. Yes. And, and you did a great job of uh, exposing that. Now, the one theme, well, there's, there's more than one thing, but the one thing, you know, one real pawn, I guess you would say, that came up in the, in the whole merger process was the role of the SIBO. And yes. it's a big one. So why don't we talk about that a little? Because I think it's a good theme to talk about uh, on the promotion of the book. You know, how was, the, how was the, you know, what was the role in your mind of the SIBO in the process of the merger of the CME and the CBOT? Well, I, I, that was actually one of the hardest parts for me to write, um, explaining that role because to anybody outside the industry and really to anybody who isn't familiar with memberships of an exchange, which is a very unique thing, um, you know, to, to this industry. The concept of this exercise right privilege, which was kind of this this key bit uh, between the CBOE, which had spun off from the Board of Trade back uh, decades ago, this ended up becoming this huge issue in the bidding war. And um, what it boiled down to is that there had been a legal battle uh, brewing about what it actually meant when a CBOT member held a CBOE exercise right. right. And, um, you know, the Board of Trade thought it meant that they owned equity in the CBOE. And so when and, you know, when it eventually would go public, they would, um, those members would, you know, be financially uh, rewarded in the IPO, um, whereas on the CBOE side, they thought, they said, no, it just means you have the right to trade here, right. um, not to, you know, the equity that you think you have. Yeah. And so what was the most, um, and that, so that was a very hard thing, and, uh, and I 
I have to really thank um, the, the Bill Brodsky and Carol Kennedy at the CBOE because the time I was writing my manuscript was actually when they were preparing to go public. And um, the fact that they helped like review everything to make sure I was wording it correctly, I, I really, really appreciate. But the other interesting thing when I was writing the book is that I was, you know, got the chance to interview the team from ICE. And they are really, you know, the ones who thought, wait a second, we can use this whole battle with the CBOE to our advantage yeah. um, and and kind of, you know, exploit the fact that, hey, if you vote for ICE instead of the Merck, we'll give you all these kind of guarantees about what your that exercise right will be worth today versus the Merck. You know, they that might ha- be a legal battle that goes on for years and, and as traders, wouldn't you rather have money in your pocket now? Right. Um, so I thought it was brilliant, <laughs> you know, that, that strategy that they used. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as, you know, the, the oh, CBOE themselves, yeah. you know, I think that they were just trying to um, yeah. really, you know, look out for themselves and say, you know, what is the best deal that we can you know, figure out for this exercise right? And it was in their best interest, too, to, to not continue on with a lawsuit about it. Right. And, and, and so it's interesting to me is it definitely was a pawn, as you said. It was, you know, and, yeah. and uh, the CME was in the CBOT were fighting over something that, you know, again, this is, I, I think, what's so ironic, I guess, about this whole idea was you've got basically a club, two clubs, right? Uh, you, you know, these clubby entities, the CME and the CBOT, which have memberships not unlike an athletic club or a, or a country club. And you have the right then to play, as you said, or, or trade down there. And that's what that, you know, but there's also has been upside in owning those seats or, or those shares right. oh, of those. Yeah. And then you have a CBO, which, you, as you said, was split off, and, and the CBOT guys said, hey, you know, we think we have essentially warrants or calls if something good happens on these also. Yeah. And uh, the CBO was like, no, you don't own that. And then the ICE said, well, <laughs> we can not only offer more money than the CME has, uh, but we're also going to uh, allow the CBO to have their autonomy Mm-hmm. And their freedom from us taking them over, so they benefit, and then so we can get their, we can kind of buy their votes when we go through this merger uh, right. voting process. So, so how did the issues all get resolved with the CBO? You know, you know, with the story. Um, well, what ended up happening is that you know, of course, the Merck and the Board of Trade did merge, um, and then. Um, I believe that the entire, you know, legal um, battle did come to a close. They were able to agree on an amount. Well, I say agree. I, I know that there are still a lot of members that, you know, on both sides that do yeah. not, you know, wish it should have been one way or the other. But I do think at that point it had been going on for years and everybody was just happy to. Um, I have an amount that they settled on, but they did um, basically make uh, several different kind of financial um, payouts to those who had different kinds of um, exercise rights, privileges, and then of course, uh, you know, CBOE was the last major exchange in the U.S. to finally go public, and right. so they did, and now you know all of that's resolved. Yeah. So now, so now, yeah, uh, here's what we have: we have the ICE still out there, and they they oh, yeah. they, uh, they they merged with uh, was it Euronext, right? Uh, not, not, uh, they had bought Nibot. Nibot. Um, Can't keep it all yes. straight. There's so much. So yeah, many. yeah, there's a lot of them. So you still, so the CME, CBOT is one entity. You have ICE, and then you still have the CBO, all publicly traded, as you said, right now here in the yes. you know, U.S. exchanges. Uh, very powerful, too. Uh, very powerful. What role do you think, uh, you, you talk about this a little bit in the book, but what role do you think the O'Connor brothers, uh, just because it's kind of timely with the, with the death, uh, recently, uh, you know, a lot of people know who the O'Connor uh, options firm is. What role do you think they played in, at the CBOT and the CBO, you know, CBO in, in that in that piece of the drama? Oh, I think you might be thinking about the other. <laughs> I did not mention. You that. didn't talk and, about them at all. I thought you talked. No, about no, I think it. that was in. Um, there's a, a wonderful, wonderful friend that I have met over the screen. Her name's Emily Lambert, Emily. and yeah. she's from Forbes. It's there in her book, and she just wrote. A wonderful, um, you know, piece on O'Connor, and, and you, so there, there, there was did. there was nothing in there uh, that you saw in the O'Connor, no, and, no. and you know, kind of the backdoor deals that were going on there. Okay, um, no, but that was out of my realm. Yeah, I understand. Um, what about? Let's talk a little bit about the future of the exchanges as we just started talking about. Sure. You know, where do you where do you think 
things kind of uh, play out. You know, obviously electronic is taking over uh, sure. the majority, but how do you see the exchanges kind of uh, developing over the next few years? Give us your, your insider's kind of two cents on it. Well, it's been interesting. I've been doing, um, you know, some talks with various business clubs and alumni clubs and whatnot, and, and what everybody seems to be very interested in, and, and, and of course, what I am also interested in is, is how all of the financial regulation that's being hammered out right now, with the help of, you know, the team from ICE and, and CME Group, right. um, how that will affect exchanges, because basically that regulation is trying to move over the huge, much, much huger, over-the-counter uh, derivatives market onto right. exchanges and clearinghouses, and so it really positions ICE and CME Group well, um, because, you know, that's that's always been the hallmark of futures trade, futures exchange trading is having clearinghouses, having that transparency, having, you know, um, the ability to uh, mitigate counterparty credit risk. And so now I feel like the entire financial yeah. <laughs> services industry is looking to these exchanges saying, "Call us. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you, you guys haven't had any of this kind of, um, you know, dramatic, uh, you know, domino effect. How, how can you? How can we take what you've done over the past 100, 150 years and apply it to this unwieldy, you know, side of the market? Yeah, um, that's now, a good point. You know, and I, I guess the follow-up question I'd have for you: Do you think the SIBO is moving a little? You know, are, are they pre- are they going to be pressed? Because of these, you know, the Dodd Frank regulations and everything that, that are being uh, proposed, do you think they'll be pressed to be more transparent and more electronic than, you know, much like the ICE and, and the CME? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think that's the way, and I think that they also realize, you know, that is the way it's going. If there's anything that I learned just in my one year um, being in the industry is, is kind of like looking at it from a business person's objective point of view is that there are more politics in, in this industry than than I could have ever imagined than I think most people realize. But the people, the business people who are running these exchanges are some of the most brilliant people. People I've, I've certainly ever come across, and I have I have the faith that they will be able to kind of cut through some of the resistance and you know get get done what has to get done. Right. Um, you know I, I think that right now with this Dodd Frank regulation, almost every milestone has been um, missed, um, right. and that's you know the CFTC just needs a lot more people and I think a lot more funding and, and help. It's it's just an overwhelming task that they have. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, do, you, do, you do you think ultimately that electronic trading is, I think it's, a, you know, I'll give you my opinion. I think it's a good thing. Do you think it's a good thing ultimately? I think it, it, it brings more transparency and I think what it does for, you know, maybe for those that are holding on, that old guard that's holding on to the kind of the bid ask, if you will, and, you know, really what are the prices and what are things worth? I think the market always is the best way. And, the, you know, that transparency will hurt kind of that old guard that is holding on to that. Would you agree with that? Disagree? You know, get some thoughts on it? No, I, I definitely agree. And I think it applies in both, you know, the established exchange futures markets and it definitely applies to the over the counter market. I mean, that's where, you know, nobody had any idea, right. um, really if they were getting fair prices. And so that's where I think there's going to be some, some hurt, which is a lot of the reason why some f- certain financial institutions are trying to, you yeah, know, the, protect I, their turf. And I still think that's where the too big to fail uh, component is, uh, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla, gorilla sitting yeah. around saying, you know, we don't want to take that pain. Uh, right. You know, and that's what they're, and I think that's really what's, again, holding up a lot of our financial, you know, our, our issues haven't you know, changed from the calamity in 08, 09. Yet yeah. we still have these, you know, gorillas hanging around and, and, and the transparency really is what will, you know, write everything. And so and to me, the, yeah, you have to have that. You kind of have to have that shakeout and that natural, you know, what is the real bid on a, you know, whether it's a house or a, a car, right? You, you've got to go to the market with it. So I think that's got to yeah. happen. But, you know, like you said, there's a lot of politics involved for, for that to happen. What about high-frequency trading? Again, you don't talk about these things kind of, you know, I'm just going to throw them off there. Uh, do you think they uh, this type of model uh, encourages or discourages volume when it comes to trading? Um, when you say this kind of model, what do you mean? Well, electronic. So high frequency trading, oh. meaning you know, uh, you know, you've got computers basically that are near the exchanges and sure. 
triggering orders all day. Do you think this is a you know good thing for exchanges? More volume, greater you know again greater liquidity, greater transparency because of you know having these electronic exchanges. Yeah, well, for I mean, for exchanges, you know, they thrive on volatility, right? right. Um, so if there's, you know, that's the first and foremost thing um, with the high frequency trading, which you know, I'm I will fully admit I'm not that, um, you know, I do not know that much about. I know that. Like many other things in the industry, there's just a lot of mystery and confusion about it. Yeah. Um, but from what I understand, it's almost, you know, seem to be this next natural progression. You know, you're going from the floor to electronic trading with individuals. Then, you know, there's people writing algorithmic programs, you know, doing this kind of high frequency trading. And to me, it's almost not a question of, is it a good thing or bad thing? It's almost a question of it's here. It's probably not going to go away. So how, you know, how can the industry mitigate, um, you know, and make sure that it's not causing, you know, that it's still giving a chance to a normal, you know, quote unquote normal individual, you know, a trader and also just not causing any uh, problems. And I think, you know, that's also some of what's being looked into with stop gaps and, and, and things like that when de- different limits are hit. Um, if there's anything, you know, versus all this stuff that we've been talking about that that makes me worry a little bit, it's how much change is going, like how much change is underway all at once. Um, it's just, you know, trying to take this huge market and bring it to be more transparent and to make rules, I think is a great thing. And I think they're moving in the right direction. But it's almost like there's so many moving parts and so many major um, facets of the industry and of the markets that that different hands are trying to control. That's what worries me more than anything. I'm a big believer in baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> and, and with this kind of stuff, it's like they're changing, trying to change everything. And unfortunately, a lot of it. Um, you know, people just don't even understand the markets in the first place that are that are calling for some of this change. I mean, the fact that there's still talk about speculators driving up prices. You know, I'm not a trader and it makes me want to bang my head against the wall. I don't even know how you guys handle it because it's so infuriating. So I think there's a long way to go still with education just overall in the industry. It's still very mysterious to the vast majority of people, even in the broader financial services industry. Yeah, it is mysterious, and a lot of it, I think, is, uh, you know, kind of the way that, you know, again, I think the old guard kind of wanted the, you know, the, yes. game, the game that way. And uh, But I, but I think innately we all trade, whether it's, uh, you know, trade trading up uh, in a car or a new house or, right. or, you know, trading down if we're getting older in life and our children are moving on. You know, we're always making decisions and, and trade-offs in our life, and I think that's, Definitely an innate behavior in all of us. So it's not as scary yeah. as it's not as scary. I think sometimes as as you say, but there, there's absolutely, as the title of your book, zero sum game. There is absolute. Yeah. There's risk, and and but you, yeah. if, if you can kind of containerize and and you know put it in parentheses, here's my risk in this trade, which yeah. is it's not absolute. That is not absolute sometimes, and you have to be as you said, you got to be good with that sometimes. Also, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I think the more transparent and the way we go, you know, I, I think it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll bring more people, you know, maybe that are on the sidelines going, I don't understand this, but you do, because you're, you, you, yeah. you know, everybody, I mean, look at Groupon. Why is Groupon so big? Because everybody likes a deal. Everybody likes a better price. Right. <laughs> so there's a reason, right. you know, they're, we're, innately we're driven that way. As, you know, as a marketing person, you understand that. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. So, you spent a year while this merger was going on. Again, whirlwind. You took great notes. Wrote a fantastic book, Zero Sum Game. What's next for you? I know, like you said, you wanted, you always wanted to be a writer. So you got your first yeah. book out of the way. That's a, you know, it's a big, big accomplishment <laughs> and a very well written one. What's next? You know, you're, you're doing some writing. You're actually covering movies for Redbox. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's interesting. You know, um, as I said, because I'm a first time writer and you know was not connected to kind of any financial publication it and because after you know right after I left the board of uh, trade or, or CME group at that time and was trying to write a uh, book proposal to get zero sum game published in the middle of all that in 2008 was when everything started going awry and of course the publishing industry was just as hard hit as 
all other industries. So while I was trying to, you know, kind of get something to happen with the book, I was approached by Redbox, uh, owned by Coinstar, um, you know, the company that has those dollar DVD yeah. medals pretty much everywhere. And they had um, been reading just a personal blog that I wrote on the side about the television series Lost um, that had grown to be very, very popular. And people at Redbox read this Lost blog of mine and uh, contacted me in the, I think, spring of 2008 and said, hey, we're going to launch a movie site. Would you be interested in writing for it? And so believe it or not, you know, since that point in time, um, I've kind of morphed into a film critic. I was just accepted into the Chicago Film Critics Association. Wow. And, you know, I get to go to movie screenings with Roger Ebert and Michael Phillips from the Tribune and people from The Onion, my heroes. And, and you know, so it's what's been really interesting is that um, so I kind of write movies by day. And I'm seeing these movie screenings and whatnot. But then now, you know, I'm going around talking about my book, which is, of course, you couldn't get more opposite right. derivatives you know, world versus, like, what's Angelina Jolie doing? Uh, so, you know, it's 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 been a hard um, industry for me to walk away from anyway. it's I feel like the people are incredible. Um, it's just so fast-paced and exciting. So I've been, I think, very, very lucky to be able to somehow, you know, b- balance both things that I love and both kind of sides of my interests. So, so, so a couple questions for you come to mind with that, uh, yeah. you know, that, that very, very, very back Background that you have, yeah. uh, as you said, movies and derivatives couldn't get any further apart. <laughs> right. What is your? So I'm sure you've had the opportunity now to probably see a number of market movies or trading movies. What's your favorite? Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, there's really only one that I feel is truly about uh, futures trading, and that's Trading Places. Um, so that remains my favorite one. Um, you know, it's funny when I when I've been uh, doing speaking engagements about the book, I usually start out with a series of um, images of the board of trade in different movies, and then I end with kind of some images from trading places. And most people are shocked. You know, most people outside of the industry are shocked that the whole frozen uh, concentrate orange juice futures are real things. Like, real, they didn't right? realize. They yeah. thought that was made up for the movie. And I'm like, no, you know, it's yeah. actually actually a real thing. But, yeah, that, that remains my favorite. Well, you know, I, I agree with you, by the way. I think Trading Places, although, you know, it's probably one of Eddie Murphy's funniest movies also. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, really, just if you really, you know, they weren't trying to. I mean, they, they were definitely had that as a backdrop again, but... That, right. The, the way that they laid out the whole way the trading works was dead on. It had nothing to do with fundamentals. You know, it had it's all emotion. <laughs> and and, and it's, right, right. And it's true. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're trading orange juice futures, coffee futures, the S and P, you know, five hundred. It's all where you know. As I always tell uh, people, you know, if you're interested in the market, where can the most people get hurt? Yeah, and and run away from that side of the boat because that's all trading is. And where can the most people right. get? You know, by by getting hurt, that could mean uh, whether you know prices are going to go down or up. It doesn't matter. That's wherever people are right. going to get hurt. It doesn't mean prices are going down necessarily. It could mean prices right. are going up. So it's wherever that that wave is about to start and where that pain is going to be felt. You know, you want to probe those pain points, and that's all trading yeah. really comes down to. And I thought uh, again, trading places is a, just a classic when it comes. Yeah. to that. So now we're coming into the Academy Award uh, season. <laughs> right. What is, your, what is your winner? Uh, give give me you know give us your best picture actor and actress for uh, 2010. Well, I'm afraid I'm not too original because uh, you're probably you're probably been reading and hearing a lot of the same thing. But I really did uh, like the King's speech the best. Um, I thought Colin Firth uh, was the best, should win Best Actor, and um, even though I never really liked her before, I do think that Natalie Portman um, and Black Swan will probably win, just because, you know, the the Academy and these voters really like to award when people lose drastic amounts of weight and, you know, yeah. train and all this sort of thing, and, and, and she did do a, a great job and um, very, very twisted movie, so those yeah. are the, the three biggies I'm kind okay. of thinking. Well, good. We'll, well see. Erica, it's been a pleasure having you on again. Yes. Zero Sum Game, if you guys are fans of Michael Lewis, 
<laughs> you're in wow. the business. You're going to read the book. I guarantee you're going to like it. But even if you're not in the business, pick this up because uh, you'll learn uh, about a business that is really, yes. uh, to me, the core of the United States and, and really, yes. to me, the, the finest exchanges are in Chicago, the CME. Uh, now that they're all part of CBOT, you have the CME and, and CBO still in Chicago. Great book, Erica. Uh, Thank you, you so much. Keep us in the loop. It was a, it was a really fun read. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs>